And welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, Episode 8, To the Hillfort. The earliest ob iron objects found in Wales is a sword that was made in 600 BC. It had been thrown into the waters of Llinfawr, above the Hronda, in the Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age. It was a popular thing to deposit items in water. In fact, the concept of hoards becomes really popular in that era. The Bronze Age at the time uh, was in an era of changing climate, and that meant for harsher winters, harsher weather in general, and for a lot of people it may have been very bleak. What this would mean for what would become Iron Age Wales is, is that people would be on a agricultural knife edge, and so people were possibly struggling and one of the things that you do in those environments is start to look for ways to help resolve the situation and as we know weather is something we can't do a whole lot about so we start to look at other forces be those forces of nature or forces of deities to try and help us out and so as we talked a couple episodes ago about the idea of burying uh, precious items into the ground or into water sources to try and solve that problem uh, this will become very popular in this late Bronze Age period. In fact, it's one of the most popular things to do is to bury uh, bronze axes. This actually comes out of America uh, in northern France, kind of around the area of Normandy and Brittany. And there are sites of hundreds of these axes being buried. And these axes were buried in such a way to show that they were not actually axes that were used for doing any actual work. Uh, typically, they had been still rough-hewn from the actual process of being made, uh, showing that they were never actually modified and sharpened properly. Also, there was deposits of clay found in them, which would have been in the creation of the mold. They would have used clay to try and develop the area where you'd normally put your, your stick or whatever to create the axe um, handle, and those still had clay deposits in them, which again shows that likely they weren't really burned out and these axes were not meant to be used for anything other than what they were in the end used for. And finally, the other evidence from this is that they were typically had high lead contents, which meant that they would bend and, and deform quite easily. So again, showing that they wouldn't have been used as a proper tool, but rather as some sort of ceremonial tool. And it does make you wonder if there was a bit of a cottage industry going on in America uh, that showed this being an important economic tool in trying to reach out to the gods. And like I said, there was deposits were quite lengthy in the thousands in some cases in and around northern France and in France in general. And that same process actually comes to Britain at this point in time in the late uh, Bronze Age. And the, the Flinvaur period uh, isn't talked about in part because we have this deposit of Bronze Age uh, ritualized axes and swords and things like that. And like I said earlier, we had our first Iron Age sword comes in about this point. And it does show that there's a heavy desire to try and change fortunes. And at the same time, we have a complete change in the way people live. And it starts generally slowly, but as we've said before, the idea of a hill fort and a roundhouse were not something new at this point. They just became much more stratified and were done more often. The, In fact, a couple of the examples that happened start to come in in the 6th century BCE. There is a cultural change at that point, and the idea of community starts to trump status. So as in the Bronze Age, status was very important. It becomes apparently a lot less so as we go into these new construction devices and new ways of looking at community. In West Wales, we have structures of houses that are built, and they're sort of like fortified farms, uh, where you'd have a small group, be it your immediate family or your immediate family, and maybe 
some extended family would live in those. And they weren't meant to sort of be a whole community or a whole tribe of people. But on the borders of England and Wales, going more or less from Scotland down, uh, all the way down to Cornwall, you have these hill forts that rise up. And hill forts can be m massive structures and have varying uses. And there's a lot of disagreement by archaeologists as to what they were used for. Specifically, some evidence shows that they were never used as settlement. Other ones show that they actually had roads and a proper community in them. So it they, they were very different depending on location and, and era. One of the largest hill forts found is found actually in a Penny Uh It is the largest such site in Wales, and it encompasses something like 60 acres. By one calculation, uh, some archaeologists think that up to 10,000 trees were felled during its initial construction. So in other words, this was a very, very well thought out and complicated item. The biggest problem is, is that, you know, you know in that situation that it's we're not talking about a small family or a small community even. We're talking about major construction projects would have taken a lot of people to actually be a part of. It might have even taken more than one season to do to make it that big. However, Archaeologists, as I said earlier, do not necessarily understand a lot about them, and especially these North, North Welsh ones, because there was a lot of them at that time period that were created, and unfortunately, there isn't any pottery to go with them. A lot of pottery actually goes out of fashion for a while at the end of the Bronze Age, uh, probably because of the lack of high status. Maybe they were using different kinds of vessels to carry their food, uh, stuff that would be combustible, like, uh, say leather or say things like wood and there just isn't a lot of evidence in a very acidic soil of these kind of things because they break down very fast whereas pottery always sort of survives these kind of things if you don't have that the evidence is and the assumption is is that things have gone backwards not forwards um so what were hill forts typically used for like i said earlier some of it was for uh protection some of which we know for a fact do some of which it was about creating a boundary, uh, be it a boundary against your neighbor or a boundary to sort of protect and keep livestock. Uh, they were communal places. Sometimes they were used for trade. So you would meet, you know, maybe these local families would live around the, the area, but then come to the hill fort to trade livestock or trade uh, cereal grains and things of that nature. So there's a lot of suggestions of what they used them for, but not a lot of actual evidence of what they used them for. Because all we can gather is what we can find in the soil, and if there isn't a lot of evidence, then it's harder to sort of define how they were used. Typically, they were different than the houses that were outside of that sort of narrow borderland. Once you get out of the hill fort zone in eastern Britain, in fact, you have settlements that are very much like farmsteads and, and sort of peaceable area. Whereas in the West, like I said before, there was a more defended, much more militant, family-only area. But what is interesting and what we start to think about is as these hill forts develop, it appears to be that you, because of the nature of the way they're built, the tribal structure starts to solidify and the community structure starts to solidify as you have these areas. Uh, and probably what we see is this combination of people coming together for a common reason then creates more reason to stay together and thus we end up with these tribes which then start to grow up and by the time the romans arrive they're already stratified and already exist but they may not have existed before that or at least not in this structural foundation the way they are now so that's one aspect of things now let's talk about the buildings that they're actually using and living and working in uh, we call them roundhouses now roundhouses and a if you go to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast, you'll actually see at the top I've got some pictures of a roundhouse. These are roundhouses that you can actually go and see at the uh, the Welsh National History Museum. Uh, you can actually go there and you can see these structures. You can actually walk in them. Uh, again, on the Facebook page, I put up a video just so you can kind of see what it was like. This is a terribly narrated video, but nonetheless, you can go in and kind of have a, an impression of how dark and how different they would have looked compared to our modern structures and how bright they are. Uh, 
Now, the interesting thing is, and some archaeologists have suspected that because of the size of these things, and some of them are massive, like they're talking about 50 feet in diameter structures, or 15 meters if you're if you're European uh, or Canadian for that matter, um, these structures could even have supported more than one story within them, which would make some sense, although I, I, I'm not sure how exactly that would work. Uh, and I'll get into the reason why in a minute, but so you have this massive round building based on posts, which are then stretched up to the center and they're, that's kind of the building structure is based around wood poles. And that is one thing that, that does create problems because while we can find typically the holes that they were put into, you can't really find the wood that they were made from. So you can only make guesses on some of this based on how big of these post holes would have been. And the good thing is you can actually get an idea of how big they were simply because of this evidence of post holes. The other thing is typically much like the hill forts, they would have defined entrances locations and they would f usually face a specific direction, probably away from the inclement weather typically. Um, and interestingly, they weren't necessarily always used for living space. Sometimes they were used for an assembly space because there's no, there's evidence of people eating and feasting, but no actual evidence of sleeping area, if you get my drift, because the, the use wasn't constant. Now, how do you make one of these roundhouses? Well, like I said, you start off with post hole, posts, which you put up to create this structure, the, the, the outline effectively. And then I would, after that, one of the things that they then start to do is they then surround it in sort of a mixture, which is then put on the bottom half of the structure, which is called a wattle and daub. Now, if you're not familiar with what that is, daub is usually created from a mixture of clay, lime, sand, and crushed chalk and crushed stone. Uh, and then it's reinforced with straw or hay or some type of, of material to kind of give it a bit of structure and stability. So then what you do is then you take uh, reeds and things and thatch and you'll use that as what they call wattle which will then be sewn in between the posts and then what you do is you take your daub and you then cover it over on the uh, the wattle and that builds your base structure and as it hardens you can put things like whitewash on it to help keep the rain out uh, this also does a very good job of, of protecting against water so obviously in a place like Britain where there's a lot of rain, you would need this kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, the roof would be a thatch roof. Uh, it would be covered and quite tall because of that. Uh, the thatch would actually work in such a way to keep things in and out so the rain wouldn't go in. But it does create an interesting factor because the smoke doesn't get out really terribly well. Uh, and, and as we go into it, we'll describe why that can be an interesting issue. Now, unlike North American, uh, plains natives that use teepees that had holes in the roof so that air could escape, you didn't have that in a roundhouse. And the reason for that is apparently is that experts thought that if you had an, an enclosed roof like that with a hole at the top, it would actually create a fire hazard and you'd end up having problems that way because it would create an updraft, which would then take, uh, things like sparks and stuff into the into the thatch and of course if it's dry then poof, there you go and so that's why they were closed in now what does this do well the thickness of the thatch and the fact that this wattle and daub is obviously surrounding the whole thing then sends that smoke into the center of the building and effectively as i said earlier having gone into one of these before one of the the quickest things you learn is how smoky it is and how cough inducing it is and how much that would just sink into your entire life because everything would be infested with it, right? So one of the things they would do, of course, is dry meat using this method. It would be smoked. It would be lovely, I'm sure. But at the same time, you're smoking yourself out. <laughs> so it must not have been the most pleasant and might explain why in some cases they didn't actually live in those buildings. But the reality of it is how... The, the one question I do have is when they talk about the concept of having a second story is we all know smoke and heat rises. Would that not be even worse in that environment? It's hard to say. So I wonder if that was more about storing things rather than making living quarters. You know, you have your attic where you store stuff or maybe you use it to dry 
meat and cure meat, or maybe you use it to uh, keep your hay and other things like that there. But nonetheless, that's kind of one of those things where you're left going, hmm, that would be quite an entertaining thing. And like I said, we don't know for sure how all this worked. We just know from sort of experimental archaeology to kind of see, you know, how would you live in that environment? And one of the things that you definitely get is this overwhelming sense of the smoke and the sense of darkness, which would have existed in there because, you know, how much open flame would you really want in that situation? So combined with all that, though, it's a great place to tell a story at because if you think of the haze and the darkness and the firelight that you would have if you were a storyteller in that period you could use it to your benefit you could strengthen the imagination of people as you describe your mighty king or tribal leader or as you go through a story of some magnificence of some mythical figure or maybe it's a big battle that was fought and you're you know it give you that sense of occasion, I guess I would say, you know, mix that in with your bit of your wine and your beer and things get interesting when we get into those kind of discussions. And I think it, it would lead itself to to being very artistic or very well thought of art. Poetry might come out of that environment because of that imagination being driven by these kind of things. And I think for me, that would be one thing that would be very exciting about this is that you would have this ability to tell a story that people would be able to use their imagination on. And it would be like the campfire stories we tell now. It's just the difference is, is you're in an enclosed environment and the weather can't get at you. So in a way, it becomes an even better place to tell a story. And a lot of these major buildings, the really big ones, were feasting areas. So much like the medieval hall, they become a place where people gather. So you would gather not just to eat, but you'd gather to party, you'd gather to discuss things, you'd gather to mourn. All of those things would now become a central point of this massive roundhouse. And so, yeah, the storyteller would probably be very important to the uh, entertainment of the local community or tribe and would probably be just as important as any of the chiefs and kings of the area. So... These roundhouses become the way to live, and for the next few hundred years are the basic living space of most Celtic Iron Age people, and that will remain so until the Roman era when houses change into the more Roman pattern. However, they do make a comeback after the Roman era when people start to kind of go back to their roots, which is strange to think about. Like, it probably likely means that the roundhouse never went completely out of fashion, because why would you go back to something? If you don't remember it, because if there's 400 years between your ancestor and you, how would you even know these existed, really? Other than, I guess, maybe there might have been a few decrepit and and scary looking ones that were left over that, you know, your your kids might have told stories about and, and you may have talked about. But other than that, it just goes to show that likely what happened was they didn't completely ever go out of fashion. People were using them long after that for other things, and thus they became still that point of use later on. And we will see in the post-Roman era that people will go back to these hill forts again as possibly protection, possibly a way to to kind of reconnect with what you'd done before because that seemed to be more successful than the current times. So the other thing that enters in, especially in the 5th and 4th century BCE, is something called the Latin art style. This is better known to us now as the Celtic art. It's the designs of swirls and whirling design fashion that we now totally associate with Celtic. It comes out of Central Europe. That's where it gets the name. It arrives to Northern France in the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age. It becomes kind of the classic way of design and and construction of art styles across Europe at that time. And like any cultural thing, it will then migrate. And it migrates as people start to coalesce and continue their associations. As we've talked about, the axe burials from, from northern France were making their way into Britain. And in fact, there's evidence that they were in southern Wales in the not far away from Cardiff. Uh, and they went even as far out to, towards Swansea area. So these... These fashions have crossed 
the channel before. So obviously, as things continue, people maintain those connections, as we've discussed before, through marriage, through slaves, through a number of other ways, maybe out of curiosity and exploration. And so these kind of things will continue. And so, again, we have this movement of a cultural idea. And again, this goes back to the whole concept of you see a sudden change and immediately archaeologists at certain points in history go, oh, that means an entire population must have changed. Well, no, it just means that an art style changed, you know, just like in the 50s, we wore certain kind of clothes. In the 60s, we wore a different kind of clothes. We had houses that looked like this in one era and like that in a different era. You know, the the idea of a suburb is something of a modern invention. All of these things kind of come about because of changing cultural styles. And no different in this case is this Celtic style enters into Britain, and it will enter in hard. And one of the first evidences we find is that uh, Carig y Druden, there they found a kist uh, where there was someone uh, of some status that was buried in it. One of the things that they found with it was something that they initially thought was a hanging bowl. And when it was rebuilt, that was kind of how it was designed and thought of. But as time has gone on, there was a reconsideration in the 80s about the design of it. And they've come to the conclusion that it looks more like a helmet. And so they redesigned how it looks. And now, structurally, it looks much more like a like a, a fancy ceremonial helmet because it was lipped. Uh, it look like a bowl. <laughs> it looks like somebody put a bowl on their head effectively. So you couldn't see it as being something that would be used in an actual military event because it would be very easy to knock off and very useless in those type of environments, but definitely was something that was used in a ceremonial or a burial, especially if the person's high status. This is one way to mark that. And this is one of the first evidences we have of this style coming over because what this helm is covered in is these celtic swirling art style and this is as i say one of the first evidences in wales one of the first evidences evidences in britain and we know that they will continue to flood in we'll get the battersea shield which is very celtic looking you get embosses shield embossings that are celtic styled you get swords you get all sorts of things which now gain that cultural style and it spreads from, you know, the lower part of Britain, from France, into Ireland, into Scotland, into Wales. And it becomes something of an, a marker for what we understand to be a Celtic person into the modern era. And it is part of the reason why there was this belief of a migration from Europe into Britain in that era of a large scale. Because you see such a sea change in the way people did things. I mean, we went from a Bronze Age where there was a lot of evidence of, of smelting, a lot of evidence of design of tools, a lot of evidence of the tools themselves, a lot of evidence of all of this stuff and pottery, to no pottery, to hardly any metal, to no more deposits, to completely different building styles, completely different uh, ceremonial styles different ritual styles, and then we get new art styles, and some think even possibly a new language that migrates across at this point. So you can see why people thought that this was the evidence of a mass migration, because all of a sudden you have a completely new environment. And the idea that the Celtic people had defeated the Beaker people and pushed them out or merged with them to become a new population, whereas we know evidentially from the DNA evidence that didn't happen, largely. And if anything, if there was a migration at all, it would be possibly more of the elites moving over, or possibly a change in, in structure of society. Uh, and likely, it was just a fashion statement. <laughs> which changed things. It was a style which changed things that may have been forced on them by climactic change through the changing environment they lived in, through the desperation of having to live through much less enticing conditions in having to deal with marauders, with bandits, with pirates, with all those things that come when societies get more desperate and the criminal factor that you have to deal with, and bands of, of brigands who may just be roaming around and destroying and stealing. 
because at some points, as you get desperate, you start to look for th ways of, of survival that don't have anything to do with maintaining family structures or maintaining the current way of life. And so you end up with this conflict. And certainly at this point, we will see more and more that this conflict will turn from being sort of a, a once in a while thing to much more evident. Uh, as we notice the influx of swords come in initially as burial features or ritualized features, but definitely swords become much more popular in this era, which shows that conflict was likely more popular in this era and a changing mentality about dealing with your neighbors changes. Thus you get hill forts because you're def maybe you're defending yourself from the local neighbor who might be a problem. Maybe your your communal group has grown together big enough to be a tribe, and now you're trying to enforce your will upon other hill forts or other topology and geography. And so these conflicts now become much more formalized and much larger. And in all likelihood, this is where we start to go from being the Britain of the Stone Age to the Britain of the Bronze Age to now the Britain of the Iron Age, where things are much more formalized, much more structured and much more like what the Romans will see when they get here, which is a structural tribal societies, which have, in some cases, developed their own coinage. They've developed a lot more trade. Uh, there's talk in the archaeological record about whether or not there was Phoenicians here. Uh, all of this stuff will start to occur and start to happen at this point in time. And also, we now start to get our first historical evidence of these people, because now, they're making such a evidence of themselves or become important enough that they reach the first peoples that are writing at this point in time and specifically writing stuff we can read. And it starts with the Greeks who are talking about it from a mythological and, and somewhat uh, rumor filled idea. And it starts to formalize more into what the Romans will eventually write, specifically when Julius Caesar gets here at the end of the at the end of the the BC era and how that will then define what we understand Britain to be at that point and going forward. So we're on the edge of historical evidence uh, instead of just archaeological evidence, but it's still got a bit to go. We're going to talk a little bit next week about Herodotus and what he thinks and Strabo and some of these people, before we finally get to our man Julius and his on-the-scene reports as he enters into Britain for the first time from Gaul and writes about it in his Gallic Wars. So we're getting there. We're, we're almost to the point where people are talking about him. But that's still a ways off. We still have some things to talk about next week. Even as we talk about the historical things, we will start to talk a bit more about how the developments of trade and of ritualization and everything else in the communications between societies begins and i hope you'll stick with me and i would just like to thank everybody who listens to this podcast thank you so much for your willingness to to give us a chance and to listen in and i hope you will comment and i look forward to hearing from you you can reach me at the welsh history podcast at gmail.com or you can talk to us on facebook as i said earlier facebook.com forward slash welsh history podcast or you can now talk to me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod uh, on Twitter. And as well, please uh, check out the Patreon that we've got going for Distractions Media. And if you'd like to contribute, we'd very much appreciate it. And you can check out everything else we do on distractionsmedia.com. Thank you and have a great day. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com. 